takes us to the book of John. Uh, this is the lectionary passage for this week, which just means that we are uh, observing and preaching from a text that many churches across the world who follow this particular uh, structured layout of week to week scriptures. We are in that space. And so many, many churches across the world are wrestling with uh, several passages. We are going to take the gospel passage, the book of John. John is believed to have been the author of this particular uh, account of the life of Jesus. You may remember that John was one of the sons of Zebedee, and he uh, was someone who uh, was called the beloved disciple. He was one of Jesus' uh, best comrades, if you will. Certainly, he was thought to have been one of the youngest comrades, thought to have followed Jesus as a disciple while he was in his late teens, uh, which just continues to remind us uh, that uh, you ain't never too young, you ain't never too seasoned to follow Jesus. When Jesus calls, all Jesus is looking for is a yes. Mm. Somebody all just holler yes. Amen. And, and, and so this particular uh, author's take on the gospel was the last uh, written gospel of the uh, kind of four canonical gospels that are captured in uh, the scriptures that we hold to be canonical. And what's fascinating about the book of John, if you read through it, it gives you a continuous expression of the divinity of Jesus. It is attempting to hold to this truth that Jesus was human and also divine, that Jesus had a certain kind of, uh, in the early church, they called it divinization, that Jesus was able to hold both the power and divinity of God uh, and also the humanity of flesh and hold it together within a very failing body. It is the miracle of incarnation, and it is indeed uh, what made Jesus such a wonder to people. Uh, because how many of you know when you walk around with a lot of divinity in you, you become a wonder to some people? <laughs> mm-hmm. And conversely, when you walk around with a lot of devil in you, you become a terror to some people. And so one of my questions always is, how much of God do we have in us and how much of the devil lingers? And what does it mean for us to take seriously that the one who we follow gives us the power through God's spirit to walk around with the power of God. So prevalent that when people interact with us, they can see Jesus. And that is uh, what our text is really going to be about today. Uh, how can we see Jesus? John chapter 12, verse number 20. Uh, we're going to kind of work our way through the first six verses in the interest of time. I encourage you to read perhaps to the end of the chapter because there's a lot of good stuff in there, particularly about walking in the light. And I always like to talk about walking in the light when I can because there's so much gloom around. Sometimes it's good to just be reminded about the light. But I'm not going to do too much with this passage because I love to man, make sure y'all come back next week. <laughs> John chapter number 12, verse number 20. The scripture says like this. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival, there were some Greeks. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Philip, another one of the disciples. And said to Philip, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew. Interestingly enough, right? You would think if they said, we want to see Jesus, you just take them to Jesus. Philip seemed to be a gatekeeper. I don't know. I don't know. You can just get access to my guy like that. We got to go talk to the armor bearer. <laughs> Uh, Andrew and Philip then went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them and said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. 
So those, this, you know, I remember when I was in, in, in Bible College Seminary, they, they talked about some of the words of Jesus being, uh, there was a whole book called the, the, the Tough Sayings of Jesus. The things that Jesus would say to just make you shake your head be like, man, what you talking about, Willis? I thought you was about love. I thought you was about life. But this is one of these tough sayings. Those who love their life will lose it. Man, that just goes against everything we're talking about here in Oakland, right? And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me in where I am. There will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to speak from the topic simply today, look out for Jesus. Or maybe another better way, clearer way of saying it is, I'm looking for Jesus. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. God, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, your people. We ask you to hide your words in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And allow me to preach and teach your word with the anointing that makes it easy for even the hearers. May it bless us today. In Jesus' name we pray, let the people of God say amen. Amen. Come on, somebody holler, I'm looking for Jesus. Now, as I began my prep for this passage this week, there were so many particular ways that I was feeling compelled to go, but one of the most uh, powerful metaphors found in this passage that kind of took me down a rabbit hole, if you will, was this whole notion of sight and vision. Now, if you were to take seriously uh, science, and we do take science seriously, biology, physiology, all the disciplines that give us a greater sense of knowledge and wisdom pertaining to our composition, how many can appreciate that we can learn how to operate a thing without fully understanding how the thing is made. I mean, you know, I uh, have a great mechanic because um, although I am quite, at least in my much younger days, industrious with my hands, I was not so with cars. I mean, I know how to change a flat tire, praise God, for the record. I hear brothers ain't learning that these days. One sister called me and said, uh, Pastor Mike, um, are you able to refer someone to me to help me change my tire? I was like, oh, what are you talking about? I think they were somewhere stranded or something, and they said that three or four fellas could not help them change a tire. And I'm not trying to be overly, uh, I don't even know what the word is. Overly uh, 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 just, just thinking that there are certain things dudes should be able to do. I'll find out the nice word for it in my study this week. But it was fascinating to me that we raising young fellas who don't know how to turn, change a tire. But maybe there'll be something in our men's group we can figure out. But I know how to change a tire. I know how to, you know, check the oil. Somebody say amen. amen. When your oil light comes on, you're supposed to check it. Things that I know how to do to maintain the operation of a vehicle, but if it gets a problem that is beyond my scope, I need to have someone who has the ability and the training to fix it right the first time. I've worked with mechanics who seem to uh, love to play practice on my car <laughs> and charge me along the way. You can operate a thing and not know how it functions. And sight is very similar. I'm 48 years old. I'm starting to wrestle with this idea that uh, I am getting older and not younger. And there was a time I had a memory that I thought was photographic. <laughs> I could 
remember people's phone numbers and details. I would have meetings and never have to take no notes and just recall things. Had a calendar that I never needed to use because I remember the time, the place, location. I could read books first time and just recall it when I spoke and when I preached and when I, I mean, photographic memory. Now I barely remember my own name some days. And similarly with my eyes. My eyes, my eyes, my eyes. I used to be able to see so well I could see into the future. Mm -hmm. And now I can barely see what's in front of my face. And so maybe that's why I became captivated with sight, because I'm on my own journey mm -hmm. about sight. And I realized and read there are five kinds of sight. There is the 2020 vision, which I thought I had. Obviously, I was not diagnosed with 2020 vision, but I just told myself this is what I had. Mm -hmm. 2020 vision does not require glasses, means you do not have any refractive errors, and your vision is focused. 2020 vision. But then there's another number two kind of sight, and it's called presbyopia. And that is, if you are between the ages of 40 and 50, mm -mm -mm, and have recently been experiencing difficulty seeing while reading or seeing things close by, it is likely you have developed presbyopia, which is the hardening of the lens of the eyes that occur as you age. Have no fear, there are reading prescriptions. Glasses you can get to help you with your presbyopia. The third version of sight is astigmatism, which is a condition in which the cornea of the eye is improperly shaped or it's the wrong size, making it difficult for the light to enter into your eye correctly. That means everything you see is blurry. Have no fear. There is a prescription that can help fix your astigmatism. The fourth kind is nearsightedness. <laughs> Things that are far away from you appear to be blurry, while things that are close by tend to be clear. Have no fear. There is a prescription that can help you fix your nearsightedness. And farsightedness, my last science lesson for the day, which is the exact opposite of nearsightedness, which just means that you may not be able to see things that are right in front of you, but you can see things that are far away. Again, have no fear. There is a prescription for your condition. Five types of sight. Among the uniqueness of our shared condition as human beings. And all of them require at times in your life, a certain kind of prescription yes, mm -hmm. to help us see things clearly that are right within our reach. I want to submit to you, beloved, that one of our greatest tasks as we go through the season of Lent, the 40 days that lead us to Resurrection Sunday, mm -hmm. Easter Sunday, is this idea that perhaps as we go along our lives, we may be conscious of things before us, but we may not always be able to see it clearly. And particularly, we may be conscious that God is around us. And yet we still may not always be able to see God clearly. 
What does it mean for you and I to be a people who can be honest on our faith journey about the condition of our eyes? Both your physical eyes, because we perceive that which happens in the world through the senses God gives us, our eyes, our smells, our hearing, our taste, our touch. And while it will be great for us to perceive reality without our five senses, how many of you know that you don't perceive reality without it being mediated through your senses? But how many of you can be honest and say, sometimes my senses betray me? Oh, Jesus. Anybody ever been tricked by your senses? It's, it's like, man, I thought... I thought, I thought that was, I mean, one great example, you know, we got, uh, and, and I want to thank God for, for Angel for being uh, one of our adjutants and armor bearers. Angel makes tea for Pastor Mike every Sunday. Make sure I'm, I'm good because my throat, you know, as I'm getting older, it don't act right. And they got these nice cups, you know, that you pick up a cup. There was a time when you made some tea in a cup. You could tell how hot the tea was by how hot the cup was. You hold the cup, and it was hot, or you felt heat through the cup, you would what? Sip the tea slowly. Because <laughs> ain't nothing worse than burning your lips or your tongue on some hot anything. Somebody say amen. Now they got these fancy cups where you don't know what's in it. It could be... Lord, have mercy. I mean, it's so insulated, you think you're drinking ice cold water and it's just hot. <laughs> what I feel in my hand betrays reality. And sometimes it's so important for us to be honest about the limitation of our senses. To be able to ascertain what God is up to. Because there are many times where God is up to something that you can't always perceive with your natural senses. Sometimes you're going to have to rely on an extra set of eyes. I hope you understand where I'm going today. An extra set of ears. An extra set of senses that by God's spirit become available so we can discern the times in which we live. How many know sometimes what you thought your senses could discern years ago, times may have changed. There was a time when everybody just felt like, oh, if we just prayed. At every single place we're in, we could guarantee God would be there. I got a notice from a friend of mine who will share with me that before one of the most wicked reporting of news related to the genocide in Palestine or the presidential campaigns that are coming or the, the, the reporting of crime and violence across the country, Fox News had a whole devotional from the Bible app to open up their news show. And I was sitting there thinking, man, there was a time where some folk would have thought, man, if we just prayed before the news, it may guarantee that God would be showing up. But I want to invite you, beloved, to understand that there are times where your senses can betray you. We can employ practices that are out of line with that which God is doing. Could it be that God's trying to do something in your life today that you must begin to ask God for some more sight? That I'm used to God showing up this way and I'm used to discerning what God is doing this way, but God, I realize that in 2024, I need some different set of eyes. 
I need a different ear because what I'm hearing is very different than what people are saying. Mm -hmm. And so you find a very interesting dynamic in this passage whereby Jesus and his disciples continuing to exist in their human context. Living as an occupied people inside the Roman Empire. And yet they are carrying on in their cultural and religious practices. The festival. Now it's important to appreciate that a festival in the kind of context of the Israel people in the text means that they always have these seasons where they remember God's past dealings with them. And recollect that if God did it before, God kept us alive. Through the bondage in Egypt, God kept us alive. Through the battles with our enemies, God kept us alive. This is how they rehearse it. Through our exile in Babylon, God kept us alive. When the Assyrians came in, God kept us alive. And even though we're still under an occupation, God is keeping us alive. They had these festivals to remind them. And if you were a descendant of the Israel nation living in different parts of the empire, whenever you had a festival, they all would come back to Jerusalem. Celebrate in this festival. Well, the scripture says that while the Jews are in this festival season in Jerusalem, some Greeks came as well, came there as well. Now, it's important to acknowledge that you could not be a Follower of Yahweh unless you were culturally, I'm sorry, biologically a Jew, a descendant of Israel. And so there were people outside of the line of Abraham as early as Abraham himself. There's a great reference to a priest named Melchizedek. It's got a type of this Bible study because, you know, I can't give it all to you one time. But I just raise that to say that even from the beginning when God called out a people, particularly a particular people, God always left the door open for other folks. Because God has no partiality. Even when we have partiality. Even when we interpret God's activity among us through partiality lenses. Even when we set up rules to keep some folk out. So we can claim some purity. God never has partiality. Oh, Lord, you ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him God loves you just how you are. You ought to tell him that God, that, that's part of our de churchifying work here at The Way. That God has no partiality. That means that you can't have a vibrant, faithful faith and hate your brother, sister, loved one because they are a different race. A different nationality. They live in a different country. They even have a different political uh, 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 set, of, set of ideas. They may have a, 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 a different sexual identity. They may have a different class location. They may have a record. Uh, you can't follow Jesus well and have in your heart partiality. Which just means that some of us have been raised in a faith that has one of them five sight problems. But have no fear. <laughs> There's a prescription for you. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him I got my prescription today. And so there you find Jesus at a festival that's only supposed to be for the Jews. And then you got some Greeks showing up. And ever since that first expression of a non-Jew aligning with the ways of Yahweh, with the Torah, with the revealed God of the, the Israel nation. They called them God-fearers. This is how the Jews would refer to folks who were not Jews, God-fearers. So these Greeks were God-fearers. They would allow them to come to their festivals. And so you had these God-fearers, these Greeks show up at a festival and they begin to ask, can we see Jesus? Now, I don't know why they wanted to see Jesus. Maybe Jesus had a lot of wonder in him. Maybe Jesus 
reputation had preceded himself. You know, when you somebody that's doing some good or some terrible work, your reputation precedes you. You can walk into a room and folks can be like, wow, happy to see you. Or man, hi, the women and the children. <laughs> what kind of person are you when you walk into a room? Folks like, man, come on, I got a seat saved for you. Or you're like, mm, there ain't no seats around and the place is empty. <laughs> but they wanted to see Jesus. And beloved, I want to give you a few points about how we can be on the lookout for Jesus. The first thing that I want you to appreciate is that seekers always find Jesus. If you seek him, Jesus, you will find Jesus. Jesus is not hiding from you. Jesus is not hard to find. We sing an old song in the church, Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. Call him up and tell him what you want. You know, good old black church songs. Had a variation of the same verse. <laughs> if you want your body healed, tell him what you want. Ooh, that thing would get good. You know, you sing it over and over again until you went into a trance. Then your body would just start going. You didn't know what to do. <laughs> Anybody remember that kind of black church church? Amen. Uh, there's something about being convinced that Jesus can be found. How I many know some of us have been unconvinced that Jesus can be found? So we stop looking for Jesus. Even John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, in an earlier account, got so disillusioned. John the Baptist was in jail, getting ready to get his head cut off. I'd be disillusioned too. Especially when it's my cousin. Ain't you supposed to break me out of here, cuz? <laughs> What's going on? I done seen you walk on water. I heard you did all these miracles, and I'm sitting up here on lockdown. Death row. Didn't I baptize you? I anointed you. I did all this stuff, cuz. <laughs> this is what you, you let me go out like this? Even John sent his followers to Jesus and said, are you the one? Or should we look for somebody else? How many know you can stop looking for Jesus when you get unconvinced that he can handle everything that pertains to you? So you start looking in other places for that which only God can do. I want you to know, beloved, that one of the ways you remain a seeker of Jesus is to train yourself, your senses, your eyes, your sight to locate God in every circumstance. Somebody, I got to train my eyes. I mean, I got to. You know, I, 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 I got I to train these senses I have because I can't see Jesus everywhere. In the text, this is powerful, they were at a festival. They weren't in the temple. Which just means, beloved, that sometimes you ain't going to find Jesus at church. Now, Beloved, I want you to come to church, please. Only, oh, Pastor Mike said church. It's, just, it's, the, it's the point. Jesus ain't going to be here. That's not what I said. Your senses heard the wrong thing. I'm just saying that there will be times people will not find Jesus at church. They found Jesus at a festival, not in the temple, which just means, guess what? Some of us got to be in other places. So God can be found. Lord, have mercy. Because 
this is my third point. I'm not going to preach it just yet. But the third point is, if you are following Jesus, guess what? Wherever you are, God can be found. Yes. That's my third point. I got one point in between before I get to my third point. But the first thing I want you to understand, beloved, seekers always find Jesus. Everybody say that. Seekers always find Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is always there. In your depression, he's there. In your heartbreak, he's there. In your rejection, he's there. At the point of death, Jesus is there. At the point of betrayal, at the point of confusion, when you're broke, when you're rich, when you're up, when you're down, when you're high, when you're sober, Jesus is there. The question you got to ask yourself is, how can I train my senses? to see Jesus at whatever season of life I'm in because you're not going to always be in a place where you're looking for Jesus with the kind of passion that you are in other places any honest folk that can say that ah when things are going great you know I'm not like you know on the lookout for Jesus I mean if Jesus, I, you know I, I, if I run into Jesus like, hey Jesus it's good to see you you know I, I wasn't running from you, but I sure wasn't, wasn't chasing you. <laughs> we got any real folk like that. You ain't running from Jesus, but you ain't chasing him. You running Jesus in the course of your life. Oh, thank God for Jesus. But I want you to know, beloved, that sometimes it will be hard to see Jesus. My condition right now is whenever I read things, when I'm on my screen, my eyes start to water. And I just thought, man, I'm just so emotional. I'm crying all the time. I'm crying. I'm just, I start reading them. I start water. Misdiagnosing myself, you know. So I was with one of my friends. We was at the Super Bowl, Ashley. And, 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 and we, we, I'm sitting there because I'm mad about all kind of drama that happened. And I'm trying to read this thing and water's coming out of my eyes. And she's seeing me squint. She's like, Pastor Mike, do you need glasses? I said, what are you talking about? Well, why are your eyes wire? I was like, man, I don't know. I think I'm mad. She's like, no, I think, I think you need glasses because I'm watching you trying to read off your phone and you're squinting. I didn't even know. So ain't it somehow you don't even know how you look to other people? That's a sermon all by itself. I ain't going to mess with y'all too much today, though. And I know this one already hard. Some of you are like, man, I wish Pastor would hurry up and say the benediction because I'm tired of talking about my senses. But it's a trip how you look to other folk when your guards are down, when you lose consciousness of yourself. You think you're looking normal and you're looking like something else. But I thank God that somebody else had some eyes on me who cared about me and helped me diagnose. And then I started to say, oh, you know what? I'm not emotional. I'm blind. <laughs> I just need some glasses. Mm-hmm. Don't ask me if I got them yet. I've just been too busy. But I just want you to know, beloved, at least I know what the problem is. And how many know knowing is half the battle? G.I. <laughs> Joe. I wish I could talk to somebody. Y'all don't, don't even know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all think Pastor Mike just got bad jokes. I don't know. But a seeker will always find Jesus. So my question to you today is, are you looking for Jesus? Because it's hard to find something you're not looking for. You may stumble into a blessing, and I, I love those kind of blessings. I'm just stumbling into it. But there are moments in your life where you must commit yourself to being a seeker of God. In every circumstance, on your job, at your school, in your career, in your marriage, in your family, in your own kind of journey towards wholeness and healing, you must be on the lookout. For God, because God is willing to show God's self to those who are looking for God. There are times when you're not looking for God and God will knock you over. <laughs> Stories like that. Knock you off a horse. You're looking up like, Lord, have mercy. I guess God's trying to tell me something. Oh, I'm rambling. Let me, let me keep going. Are your eyes trained to see and find?
find Jesus in every one of your circumstances. My second point, because it's going to bleed into my second point, is this. The danger of not being able to see Jesus well can cause you to act with partial sight and attempt to live it out as absolute truth. Theologically or politically, that's called fundamentalism. When you have a partial truth or view and you live it out as if it's absolute, Fundamentalism is antithetical to seeing Jesus. Because God's too big. <laughs> Do you understand what I... God is too big for you to get it all in one view. Be afraid. I mean really afraid. Of people who make you think that they got all of God. Well, I understand God perfectly. And so since I understand God perfectly, it's my job to then... Convert you by hook or by crook, by violence or by persuasion, by voluntary. It doesn't matter. I'm going to enforce my view on everyone. How many of you know God didn't even do that? So if God didn't do it, why do you want to do it? It's because you're not really following God. You're following your own human weakness. And this is, beloved, where the second point is how we must move from sight to vision. Now, I like this distinction in my study because it simply said that while sight refers to the physical attributes and performance of the organic components involved in the visual system, vision is a thought process which emerges as an understanding of what you see. Let will say this again, because it, it took me a minute too. Sight refers to my physical process. Vision refers to my mental discerning process. Which is just to say, just because you see it with your eyes does not necessarily mean you've discerned it through the process of your thoughts to ensure that what you're seeing is being rightly interpreted and acted upon. If you are too fundamentalist in your thinking, if you don't have room for some space for God <laughs> to move, you'll act in ways that are antithetical to what you see or what you desire to achieve, which is just to say, beloved, that we must be a people who are able in this time to embrace all of what we know about God, seek after God, pursue God, but resist the urge to use violence, force, and domination to validate that which we have seen. Right now in this country, there's a rise of political Christian nationalism. There's a version of Christian Zionism. All these ideological, political philosophies that if you put Christian in front of them, people think that it becomes okay. But guess what? Christian murder is still wrong. Christian abuse is still wrong. Christian exploitation is still wrong. Christian violence is still wrong. So you can't just slap Christian in front of your mess. <laughs> I'm no, you're not following Jesus with that. You have become that which God has tried to work out of you. And so when you move from sight to vision, you begin to resist the urge to control that which you have no ability to control. How many know it's hard to control something outside of your control? How many know it's hard to control that 
which is within your control. So why, how, that's why you got to just give up all your control to God. And let God be God. Listen. And you be faithful to God. Come on, repeat after me. Let God be God. And I be faithful to God. It's going to hurt before it gets better, but it's going to get better. I promise you. Say it again. Let God be God. And I be faithful to God. That means when you get mistreated, you got to let God be God. <laughs> Can't pull out your pistol and be like, all right. Fat enough. Pow, 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 pow in Jesus' name. No. But how many know that's how we move? That's why we try. Lord knows I try to be nonviolent in my sensibility. Because if we do not resist the evil of violence in this world, we will become agents of death and still believe we're following God. God does not need creation to kill one another in order to validate God. That is an idol. That is us worshiping God in our own image. And as we get closer and closer to Calvary, this is why the Christian gospel is so hard for people to take seriously at various times in our lives. Because evil is real. Somebody say amen. amen. Death is real. Somebody say amen. Amen. Violence is real. Somebody say amen. Injustice is real. Armies are real. Bombs are real. How can I stay faithful to a God that I can't see, but I can see the violence and the wickedness in this world? That's the struggle. I struggle with it. But that is why we do the work of justice. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of fleshly origin, but they're mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, which just means, beloved, that you may not have a pistol, but you got something greater. You got God. And I want you to know, beloved, that God is greater than a pistol. Whew, Jesus, help me to preach this more. God is greater than a bomb. Because God outlasts empires. You want to know? A even more reassuring truth for us. So do God's people. God's people outlast empires. Now, beloved, this may be hard for us to hear. Not every one of us will outlast empire. Some of us are going to die before we see the promised land. That's what it means to be human. I'm going to tell you, run out here and just die. Live. Love, live. Go to the park. Find some love. Build a life. Pursue your vocation. But the people outlast. It was such a blessing to see the ceremony here. I, I saw it on Sister Moni's page of the Ohlone people getting their land back to them. Uh, I want you to think about this for a second now. When I came to Berkeley, nobody was opening up meetings, giving homage to the Ohlone land that we're on. Nobody. In the most progressive part of the country, arguably, supposedly. Less than 20 years from me being in Berkeley, just myself, people are giving land back to the rightful descendants. Not all of the Ohlone people get to be here to witness that. But guess what? The Ohlone people are outliving. This empire called America, because quiet as it's kept, this empire is crumbling right before our face. I hope you understand this. I don't know what's coming next, but guess what? We will outlast the empire. God's people outlast empires. There's always been followers of God at every stage 
of the world. During kings, queens, princes, princesses, emperors, presidents, prime ministers, the title may be different, but guess what? God's people persist. Why? Because we must be faithful unto God. I don't know why I'm preaching this this morning. I, I don't know what, what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm trying to give you some reassurance, beloved, in a world that is crazy, bombarding our senses. People are losing hope. People are feeling like the world is coming to an end. Listen, we're not the first people to experience political upheaval. There are nations all across this world that have had to endure the upheaval of the status quo. I want us to be people, though, who are, with that in mind, seeing God in the midst of it. How do I see God? I take care of those who are directly impacted by violence and injustice. I welcome the stranger into my home. I love those who are unlovable. I Heal, expand healing to those who are sick. I see Jesus everywhere. The Greeks came and said, sir, we want to see Jesus. It's always so important to acknowledge that those who are looking for Jesus often start with Jesus followers. So we have a responsibility Make sure, number one, they know you are a follower. Maybe they were just working up to random people. Hey, do you know who Jesus is? If they were and they didn't have that connection, they may say, oh, no, I never heard of Jesus. Okay, thank you. Guess what they kept doing? Looking for Jesus. Do you know? Oh, yeah, yeah I know Jesus. Can you know how to find him? No, I don't, I don't know how to find him. No, me and him not cool like that. But I heard, I think uh, 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 he got a boy named Philip. Oh, okay. Well, well, where's Philip at? Philip over there. Phil! (laughs) Your name ever get called? When someone's trying to find God? But they're like, oh, no, you definitely, no, you you can't help me with this one. (laughs) I'm looking for Phil. I'm not looking for you. Hello, somebody. Two weeks we have until Easter Sunday. I want to believe there's some people in your family looking for Jesus. I want to believe there's some people in your neighborhood looking for God. I want to believe there's some folk on your job, at your school, on your block, in the neighborhood, in your mentoring class, looking for God. Are you the one that can extend to them an invitation to see Jesus? Stand with me, everybody, and let's take a few moments to pray. If you don't mind, grab someone's hand, just touch one another with some love, with some solidarity this morning. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we lift our hearts and our voices to you today because we know that you've given us eyes and ears to sense you, but we can also acknowledge that there are times where our eyes and our ears betray us and we can't always ascertain where you are. So God, I pray for my beloved neighbor who I am touching today. Give them eyes that they may see. Give them ears that they may hear. Give them consciousness so they may acknowledge your proximity even in their worst moment and circumstance. When they're inclined to turn to the bottle for relief, I pray, God, that you will be found there. When they're inclined to turn to the substance for 
relief, I pray that you will be found there. When they're inclined to turn to whatever alternative because they can't see you, I pray that 44, 2020 vision would break into their spirit so they can see you, God. This is our prayer, Lord. We want to see you. We want to see you in our highs and our lows. We want to see you in our doubts and in our high places of faith. We want to see you amidst the violence in Palestine and Haiti and East Oakland. We want to see you, oh God, in the heavenly places of the Sequoia Redwoods, oh God, and, and the parks that we hike. We want to see you in, God, the, the happiness of our marriages. We want to see you in the pain of our divorces. We want to see you when our children are winning. We want to see you, God, when we're estranged. We want to see you when we're rich. We want to see you when we're broke. We want to see you when we win. We want to see you when we lose. We want to see you when we're promoted. And we want to see you when we're fired. God, we want to see you. So show us your face. So we can see you. And I pray, God, that you will let my beloved neighbors see you clearly today. In the name of Jesus. Amen.